So uh, this is the third part of female genitalia. So we're going to deal with the uh, placenta mainly. That's the main uh, part and that's one of the hardest slides. Uh, and then uh, briefly the umbilical cord and another main uh, part, but histologically much uh, easier is the mammary gland. So let's start with the placenta. The good news is, I don't know if it's good news, but the good news is that you uh, second semester students uh, theoretically know a lot about first semester embryology and you covered actually most of what I'm going to say today about the placenta. It's just a little bit different um, this semester because you already know the structure of the uterus, uh, you already know the hormones. So in the first semester when you did the embryo, it was much harder to, uh, to see the structures. So uh, this very simple slide should be the first thing you learn and the first thing you say about the placenta when you get the slide that it has actually two main parts, one maternal and one fetal. And on both sides, as this very simple drawing shows, we have a plate and from both plates things grow uh, toward the other direction, okay? And this is how the placenta is formed, as if you put two hands together, okay? On both parts, we have a plate, and from the plate, villi or septa grow out towards each other, okay? This is the placenta. So the uh, maternal part of the placenta is the decidua. Which part of the decidua? The basalis, decidua basalis which has a plate, a basal plate or decidua plate. And from this plate, outgrowing so-called maternal or placenta septa. On the other side, we have the uh, fetal part. The fetal part is the chorion, more precisely the chorion frondosum, chorion frondosum, uh, which has again a plate and the outgrowing uh, chorionic villi. I changed the pointer. The outgrowing chorionic villi. And you can see that between the two, we have a space which is called intervillous space between the villi, intervillous space. And this is filled with blood, maternal blood. So these uh, red dots represent the blood cells. So please review entire first semester embryology regarding the placenta, the fetal membranes, the implantation, you actually covered quite a lot in the first semester. So let's revise a little bit the uh, implantation process. As you remember, after uh, fertilization, the fertilized egg is traveling in the fallopian tube and then arrives to the uterus around day five, and then in this, uh, on this day, the stage is blastocyst, early blastocyst, when we only have the embryoblast and the trophoblast layer. This picture here shows the most common site of implantation. As you remember from the last lectures, the entire uterine wall is prepared every month, every cycle for implantation. So the uterine wall in this stage is in secretory phase, waiting for the embryo to implant or blastocyst at this stage. And this uh, posterior lateral uh, wall is the most common site for implantation, but it could happen other places at other places too. Sometimes it causes problems when uh, it is in a very peripheral uh, place. So this... Um, Blastocyst with the trophoblast layer outside finds uh, a point where it's going to implant. It attaches to the uh, uterine surface here. And then the uh, uh, trophoblast cells produce enzymes to, to kind of um, uh, implant, actually implant, so to deeply swim in to the uh, uh, endometrial wall. Of course, for that, we need to digest mm -hmm. the endometrial wall, not only the surface and uh, epithelial cells, but also the stroma cells underneath 
and the blood vessels. And obviously, uh, more nutrients are on this side, uh, on this side where uh, the blastocyst is implanting. So here, this side will grow much faster, okay, where the embryoblast uh, is. And this is where we have the villi growing. So if you remember all these uh, developmental stages we learned in the first semester, because this, these are two parallel processes, the further development of the blastocyst and the implantation. So by the end here, the uh, blastocyst is fully implanted. It looks completely different uh, with, um, uh, with its embryoblast and the trophoblast layer, two sublayers. The trophoblast layer will divide into the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the embryoblast has the epiblast and hypoblast, the amnion and the yolk sac. And between the embryo and the trophoblast, we have here the so-called extra embryonic mesoderm, as you uh, remember. So these are just uh, show, uh, pictures, some slides showing you from Dr. Horvath's lecture last semester that you already did this. So please review those lectures and those topics, and then you will remember very well. So I'm just showing it uh, from Dr. Horvath's lecture, but now we are doing the details. So going back to this, when the implantation is completed, if you remember this picture and you revise the parts of the blastocyst, you, you actually already know the beginning of uh, the placenta formation, because here we have the embryoblast, the trophoblast with the two sublayers, the cyto and syncytiotrophoblast layer. The cytotrophoblast means cyto cell, so that you can see the cell borders here very well. The syncytiotrophoblast, syncytio means continuous, so it's, it's a continuous cell mass without visible cell borders, there are no cell borders because it's a continuous cellular mass. And uh, these two are the trophoblast sublayers. And then we have this extra embryonic mesoderm, which is a very loose mesenchyme, uh, very loose mesenchymal tissue. This is between the embryoblast and the trophoblast layer. It's outside the embryo. That's why it's called extra embryonic. And these three layers, the syncytiotrophoblast, the cytotrophoblast, and the extra embryonic mesoderm build the chorion. Many times people cannot answer this question. Everybody usually knows, okay, we have chorion in the placenta and <clears throat> the chorionic villi, but when we ask what is chorion? One of the fetal membranes consisting of these three layers or parts since it's your trophoblast, cytotrophoblast, and extra embryonic mesoderm, okay? And as I said, the syncytiotrophoblast cells, which are outside, they produce digestive enzymes, and this is very important for the implantation and also for the, the growth of the uh, uh, villi. And here you can see that also, already in the very beginning, Maternal blood vessels are also digested. Vessels are also digested. So that's how these blood-filled lacunae are formed in the very beginning. And this supplies uh, the uh, developing embryo from very early time, of course, by diffusion from these lacunae. That's a primitive kind of uh, circulation at this point. We cannot say it's the placenta yet, but it's a primitive circulation. From this point, then you can imagine that if we are focusing on this part, this is where we have all these blood vessels. So that's where this outgrowth will happen from the trophoblast cells. And the other side won't develop so fast and so much. So we are just focusing now on this side where the embryo is. And this is where the villi grow out. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary villi. Again, I refer to last semester because you already did uh, learn this. So we have primary villi, 
only containing the trophoblast cells. Here you can see this. And then we have secondary and tertiary villi. Secondary villi contain the extra embryonic mesoderm and tertiary villi have already blood vessels. As uh, in many places we have seen this, blood vessels carry, uh, connective tissue carries the blood vessels. So uh, during development in primitive connective tissue, which is the mesenchyme, blood vessels develop, differentiate. And this is what happens here. Uh, tertiary villi already contain the fetal blood vessels. And you can see that um, it's like a tree. Once it outgrows, then it branches. And here you can see that uh, this starting or stem villus grows toward the other side, and then it will anchor there. So it will attach to the uterine wall. And then the further development is just that it further divides and branches into many, many branches, okay? And this will be the field of one stem villus, okay? And between the villi, we have uterine blood vessels flowing in, and this is why the so-called intervillous space is filled with maternal blood. And uh, the other side, as I said, uh, decidua basalis and corium frondosum. Why is it frondosum? What does frondosum mean? Frondosum means bushy, because it's actually where the villi grow. So on this side, this will be the corium frondosum, where all these villi grow. And the other side will be the, the chorion lever, chorion lever, where uh, there are no villi. This means smooth. The decidua, this is what we did already actually yesterday or, uh, or last week, so the last uh, lecture, the different parts of the decidua and what decidua basalis means. So decidua means pregnant endometrium. This is the endometrial wall during pregnancy, and it has different parts regarding uh, to the position. Here, decidua parietalis, where we have no embryo, no fetus. This is the decidua parietalis. This is what we have as a slide separately. The so-called pregnant uterus slide is the decidua parietalis. Then this is the decidua basalis towards which part the implantation happens and where the placenta is formed and which makes part of the placenta, the maternal part. This is the decidua basalis. And the rest of the embryo is surrounded by the decidua capsularis, like a capsule. That's why uh, the name is decidua capsularis. With the um, further growth of the uh, embryo, after a few months, the decidua capsularis will reach the parietalis and the two layers will fuse. And then the uterine cavity here will disappear. So just to revise very briefly what we did last week with the uh, decidua parietalis, here you can immediately recognize that this is the decidua because of the layers. Here we have the spongy layer with remnants of the maternal glands. And as time goes on, we have less and less glands because we don't need the glands for nutrition anymore. Of course, once the placenta is formed, uh, because there is real circulation. So uh, the glands will be rudimentary at the end. And a compact layer here, where enlarged, we can see these huge decidual cells, which are really with, uh, filled with the lipid and glycogen. And this is very typical, the decidual cells. Of course, as decidua basalis builds part of the placenta, we will see decidua in our placenta slide as well. Okay, and the basal layer is very thin during pregnancy. It's kind of compressed, so it's very hard to recognize the basal layer, but actually you can see the three layers of the decidua. The decidua also grows septa. You remember I told you that we have a plate and then things outgrow. 
so from the decidua, we have also growing septa, so-called decidua or placenta septa between the villi. This is my favorite drawing of the placenta. It really summarizes what you can uh, find and what I said so far. So this is the already formed placenta. Here you can see uh, the junction between maternal and fetal side, where we usually have a so-called fibrin layer, where the maternal and the fetal sides meet each other or are attached to each other. So this is the decidua, and this is the feta part, the chorion frondoso. Here in the decidua, you can see the compact layer, the spongy layer with some uterine glands, and the basal layer. And then in the slide, we would have the myometrium. Myometrium is part of the slide, but is not part of the placenta. Okay, so this is the endometrium. On the other side, <clears throat> we can see the chorionic plate. This is the plate. And from the plate, the outgrowing chorionic villi. These are the villi, uh, which are already, of course, tertiary villi in the fully grown placenta. We have tertiary villi with blood vessels because that's the whole point that the blood vessels will end up here, will add up to build the umbilical vessels, which then takes the blood uh, to and from the baby. So uh, these are the chorionic villi. You can see that they branch like a tree. We have the stem villus or anchoring villus anchoring to the chorionic plate and to the basal plate. So we have these anchoring villi, which are attached to both sides. And then the rest of the uh, villi freely float in the intervillous space, which is filled with maternal blood. Okay, this is a very important uh, structure. Here you can see that there are things growing down from the um, decidua. These are the so-called decidual septa. And between two septa here, we have the so-called cotyledon. And one cotyledon is actually the area of one stem villus. So the branching of one stem villus here. This is a macroscopical unit. You can see, I will show you a picture later. You can see the so-called cotyledons, which is then this unit between two placental septa and one, the area of one original villus. And on the innermost surface, you can see the amnion, the amnion, which is a simple cuboidal epithelium. This is the innermost covering. You remember from, again from first semester embryology, the two fetal membranes are amnion and chorion. So here we can see this amnion and chorion. So if you understand this picture, if you understand the basic structure of the placenta, the slide is not so uh, hard. Just a few more words, I will show you, of course, the slide uh, about the different uh, names of the villi. <clears throat> Here, uh, you, can, uh, you have the stem uh, villus and the anchoring villus on the other side, where the villus is anchoring uh, the whole bush to the um, decidua. And the other villi are freely floating in the intervillous space. This is where, through these villi, through these ends, this is where we have the exchange of nutrients. So this is where we have the real barrier between mother and baby. And we have also the so-called extra villus trophoblast cells. Again, if you look at this picture, you can here recognize that the syncytio trophoblast and cytotrophoblast cells uh, kind of outgrow the villi and make a plate, a closing plate on the other side as well. So actually this uh, picture that I showed at the end is oversimplified because it should be from the fetal side, another closing uh, plate. These are the extra villus trophoblast cells. Here you can also see that they form a closing barrier and only the uterine blood vessels can uh, pierce them. 
So uh, this is our slide. I will show you details, of course, and uh, it makes it difficult and why students are scared to get the placenta slide because it looks too messy, probably. All these, except for a few septa, all these are the branches of these chorionic trees, chorionic villi. So if you imagine we, we take a section here, then you can see very small and much, much bigger sections, cross sections, longitudinal sections, oblique sections of the chorionic villi, okay? But these are all chorionic villi and the few septa. Placenta septa are uh, much fewer in number. So these are the things you have to show. On one side, you see this very whitish plate. This is the chorionic plate. The amnion is often missing. So here, for example, is missing. And on the other side, we see the decidua, and then comes the muscle. So you can recognize the maternal side very easily because there is the muscle, the myometrium, which is not part of the placenta, but part of the slide. So you can find it and it helps you see which side is the maternal side. Let's see uh, the circulation, which is of course a very, very important thing. And you will learn a lot more about this, of course, in physiology and especially in obstetrics, uh, because there are a lot of placental diseases or malfunctions when uh, the baby is uh, suffering of hypoxia and blood supply and all kinds of malformations can happen or injuries. So the placenta circulation, uh, here you can see that the whole, if you look at the whole placenta, it's like a disc. And these are the placental septa growing from the endometrium. And from the other side, these really, really branching things are the chorionic villi. And this closed uh, barrier is only pierced by the, by the uterine blood vessels. And with high uh, blood pressure, comes in the uterine artery blood, arterial blood. And then, of course, the nutrients, not the blood itself, but the nutrients, oxygen, etc., and the nutrients go through the barrier to be taken up by the embryonic blood vessels or fetal blood vessels. And then they are collected. And the biggest blood vessels are the umbilical vessels, umbilical veins take us up the uh, nutrients. As you remember, it's exactly reversed. So the vein carries the oxygenated blood and blood rich in nutrients. And the artery carries the deoxygenated blood and um, already not rich in nutrients. And then the uterine vein takes it up. So this uh, uh, exchange <clears throat> is very, very uh, important. What is this barrier that the nutrients have to go through, have to pass? Of course, it's here, as you see in this picture, is the chorionic villus, okay? So the, the villi are swimming, are floating in this blood. So uh, the nutrients have to go through all these layers, okay? And this layer, logically, will be thinner as time goes on. So we have a difference between early and late placenta, or the first and then second and third trimester placenta. The early placenta has still all the layers. So we have the syncytiotrophoblast, cytotrophoblast, the extra embryonic mesoderm, and then of course inside here, inside the villi, we have all these capillaries, all these blood vessels, so the endothelial cells of the capillaries, okay? As time goes on, you can imagine that the baby grows much bigger than the placenta, so we have, uh, uh, we have to make this diffusion more efficient, which means we need thinner barrier, and this is exactly what happens uh, in the late or mature placenta, the, uh, tropho the trophoblast layer becomes really thin. The syncytial trophoblast cells become thinner and the cytotrophoblast cells disappear from many parts. Not entirely, 
but from many parts, especially the ends of the floating villi, we have no cytotrophoblast cells. And then uh, the uh, uh, capillaries are also forming a much richer network. So they are very, very profusely branching. So in many places, there is a direct contact between the capillaries and the syncytiotrophoblast cells without any mesoderm and with no cytotrophoblast cells. So it's a very direct contact. Yeah? On the other side, we have maternal blood, and then it has to diffuse uh, to the um, nutrients, have to diffuse to the fetal capillaries. Okay. If we go back to this picture, here you can see that we have uh, the cytotrophoblast cells and the syncytiotrophoblast cells shown by a white line. And the cytotrophoblast cells uh, remain in the middle, but from the ends, they disappear. Okay, so from many places, they disappear to make this barrier thinner. The syncytiotrophoblast cells always remain. And here you can see in the slide what they look like in early placenta. We can really see these layers we have outside always the syncytiotrophoblast cells, then the cytotrophoblast cells, then this whitish connective tissue is the mesoderm with a few blood vessels. Here, this is the late placenta. You can see that from many places, not everywhere, but from many places, the cytotrophoblast cells disappear. So here, for example, it's a very thin layer in direct contact with capillaries. Here you can see as well. Here you can see the red blood cells and the, in a capillary and in direct contact with the outside, one single layer, very flat, since it's your trophoblast layer. So this is where we have the very close contact. So we have two slides, the early and the late placenta. And the early placenta is much thicker. The decidual layer is much uh, thicker and the barrier is much thicker as well. Here you can see anchoring real life fibrin, you will do the details in class, in histology class. And a few maternal glands, you can uh, still clearly see the layers of the decidua. And here, all these white things, all of them are chorionic villi. We have small sections, bigger sections, and the things that look completely different, not this whitish uh, mesenchymal tissue, but completely different. Outside we have trophoblast cells, but inside we have deciduous cells. This is a placental septum. Here is one and here is one. Okay, you can, if you, if you scan uh, the slide, you can find few, much fewer in number uh, septa and you will have to be able to show this in the exam. Also, we can see these knots here, for example, on the side, these are called syncytial knots uh, from actually old cells, which get into the circulation of the mother. So we have quite a few in the maternal blood. And uh, you just have to be able to name these cells, but you don't have to show them the so-called Hofbauer cells, which are mac macrophages. And don't forget what I already showed you in the first semester when we uh, and blood formation. And we talked about red blood cells, which obviously don't have a nucleus, but in the beginning of development, they do. And uh, until week 12, we have nucleated red blood cells. And this is um, a very important for pathologists as well. So it has a, a clinical relation, a clinical importance because of course, uh, many times they have to investigate aborted tissue uh, and <clears throat> from spontaneous abortion, for example, and you need to, to see what was the problem, uh, if there was any problem, what was the age of the pregnancy. And uh, so gestational age can be estimated very easily. If you see only, like here, uh, only nucleated red blood cells, it's week seven, eight. If you see a mixture like here, you see some of them are nucleated, some of them are not. Uh, it's uh, till week uh, 12. And then after week 12, 
you see in the villi, inside the chorionic villi, only non-nucleated uh, red blood cells. So this is important in pathology. The late placenta, here you can see this is our slide with small magnification. Uh, half of the slide is actually the myometrium. Don't forget, I already said that myometrium is in the slide, but it's not considered to be part of the placenta. And here, this very thin line where the pointer is now, this is the endometrium, this is decidua. So it's much thinner, the decidua is much thinner than in the early placenta. We don't really see maybe a few remnants of the uh, uh, stratum spongioso, maybe just a few uh, glands we can see. And uh, this is uh, because we don't need the glands anymore. So they obviously get rudimentary at the end because once the placenta circulation is established, we don't need those uh, glands to provide nutrients to the baby. And then this very messy part, this is where we have this fusion. So we have the chorionic villi and the placenta septa and a lot of maternal blood between the villi in the intervillous space. And if you go to higher magnification, that's what you will practice in class. Um, here you can see that the villi with high magnification have a much thinner wall. This is what I explained that at the end, the barrier comes much thinner, this placenta barrier. Since it's your trophoblast cells are always there, this is what provides the real barrier for the nutrition and also an immunological barrier. It's a very important, as you remember, the uh, growing baby is actually a foreign body. Immunologically speaking, it's, a, it's an antigen. So a foreign body is growing inside the mother. So this immunological barrier is extremely important. So these pictures also show the placenta. You can find these strange looking things, but if you remember these three dimensional pictures, for example, this one, then you can understand if we have like an oblique section like this, we can have parts in the slide from the chorionic plate with very big blood vessels. Even the beginning portion of the umbilical cord can be in some of the slides. So if we go uh, back here, you can see this is the chorionic plate with huge blood vessels. And uh, in some slides, you can even find the, um, the beginning part of the umbilical cord. And uh, as I said, sometimes the amnion is, because it easily comes off, so easily comes off, so sometimes it's missing. But here you can see in this example, uh, the, amnion, uh, the amnion layer, which is simple cuboidal layer. The human placenta is, uh, has a discoid shape. I will show you another picture. It's hemochorial. What does it mean? Maternal blood is in contact with the chorionic plate. Uh, it has a special name because fortunately you don't, you don't have to learn them, but in many other animals, the placenta structure is completely different. There are several types of placenta, so it's not the same in every uh, mammal, mammalian species. Then a very important aspect is also that the placenta is also an endocrine gland or it has endocrine function, better to say. The syncytiotrophoblast cells produce a lot of hormones. We already talked about HCG, the human choreogonotrop hormone, the so-called pregnancy hormone, very important, but also produces progesterone, estrogen, and the human somatomammotrop hormone, which is important for the development of the mammary gland during pregnancy. So uh, the endocrine function is very important. And this is what the placenta looks like at birth. Please, oh, I'm sorry, you can't ask your teacher anymore to show you uh, because we're going online. But um, uh, if you have the chance, look at the placenta uh, because um, it's very good to see at least once. It's about 20 centimeters, a half a kilo, and it has a maternal and the fetal surface. On the maternal surface, you can see these units. These are the cotyledons, okay? And on the fetal surface, of course, you see uh, the uh, joining <clears throat> blood vessels, which finally build the umbilical cord blood vessels, okay? Here, the uh, cotyledons are very important when the placenta is born 
to see if all the cotyledons are intact, because if one is torn, it means that the other part is still inside the uterus, inside the mother, it has to be taken out because it can cause very severe infections. Okay, uh, we jump through the umbilical cord because we again did this in first semester as a slide as well. So it's a very easy slide. It's the happy face with the two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein outside covered by the amnion. And inside, that's why we did it in the first semester, has the so-called Wharton's jelly. It's really a jelly like a tissue with more than 90% water and the water is bound by the hyaluronic acid. And uh, due to this very high water and very high gag, that's why very high gag contact, there's a slight basophil staining. Please review first semester histology as well. The functions we also mentioned in first semester, of course, to protect the blood vessels inside. And also after birth, it dries off very easily and very fast, which is very important against infections. And the umbilical vessels, if you look at the vein, it's also thicker than veins of the same side elsewhere. So uh, these are very thick blood vessels. Arteries are very muscular as well. And sometimes we can see other structures of, as well. Obviously, our umbilical cord slide is from a, a newborn baby's umbilical cord. But again, embryology, you remember in the beginning, the umbilical cord has a lot of other structures. For example, allantois, vitellointestinal duct, and more blood vessels. And uh, sometimes you can find remnants of the, uh, of the uh, vitell vitelline duct or allantois. And uh, I'm sure you heard about the stem cells from the umbilical cord, but now we know that uh, you can actually have stem cells from many other tissues. Uh, the external genitalia would be our next topic, but I just wanted to show you these pictures for completion because we don't have a slide. So you, you don't have this as a topic, but uh, just to show you that the structures are similar to the male uh, genital like clitoris is still similar in histological structure as well to the uh, penis. We have erectile tissue here too. And uh, we have glands that I already mentioned that the vagina, the so-called Bartholin glands or uh, greater vestibular gland, which opens into the vagina and it corresponds to the male bulbo urethral gland and is a mucus gland. It opens to the vagina and helps moisturizing the vagina. And this is the uh, labia majora and minora. And here you can see the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium with a lot of pigmented cells. And here we have sebaceous glands also opening directly onto the surface. This we, we ask sometimes at, at the skin slides, for example, where you talk about sebaceous gland. Uh, and we have this semester the lip slide where we also find sebaceous glands opening directly to the surface, not to hair follicles. So the question might come up, where else do you have such glands? And you can mention this area. And the last part, which uh, uh, is very important, is the mammary gland. We have two slides. We have the lactating and the non-lactating mammary gland. So as you see here, uh, we basically have a very branching tubular system. And in non-lactating mammary gland, we have either completely absent or very small acini. And uh, here you can see at the end, these small groups of uh, acini. And uh, the duct is called lactiferous duct, which is surrounded by myoepithelial cells. And they are collected, and at the end, before the opening, they form a bigger sinus called lactiferous sinus. Okay, and they open with a lactiferous pore at the end. So here, the unit, the histological and structural unit, is the duct and the um, uh, the group of acini, one group of acini. This is called TDLU, the terminal duct lobular unit. So one such unit is a TDLU. At the end of the terminal ducts, we have the progenitor cells from which 
the acini uh, of the lactating gland can develop. Unfortunately, tumors can develop too. This always uh, changing, growing, then uh, degenerating, then growing, degenerating. Uh, so of course, all these uh, tissues are uh, uh, can grow tumors, and this can happen in men too. So we have male uh, memory uh, tumor as well. The interlobular connective tissue is very rich in fibers and fat cells. And we have, of course, receptors for, for hormones, estrogen, and progesterone. During the cycle, the breast changes as well. And this is what I'm going to show here. Um, this picture shows female before puberty, which is very similar to the young uh, and adult male gland. Okay, We have just a few uh, ducts here. And the growth of ducts is due to estrogen. So at puberty, when the breasts grow, this is due to estrogen uh, increase. So the ducts grow out. And uh, during the cycle, this is the first half of the cycle. This is the second half of the cycle. You can see that in the second half, uh, because of progesterone, the growth of the acini, growth of the secretory portions also happen. Okay, uh, further growth is at pregnancy due to further hormones, uh, progesterone, and also the placenta produces hormones which are important for growth of the mammary gland. And then, of course, fully developed, we can see it uh, at lactation, when we have huge secretory portions and um, the milk production is uh, stimulated by prolactin, and the milk ejection is stimulated by oxytocin. Oxytocin, uh, uh, oxytocin stimulates or uh, yeah, stimulates the myoepithelial cells of the duct, and this causes milk ejection. Okay, and this is after uh, lactation ceases. And during menopause, the uh, glands, the acini, also degenerate, so we have a similar structure to. Uh, before pregnancy. So here is just to show you that these receptors are very important in pathology for diagnosis and for therapy as well, that uh, the tumor, the mammary carcinoma, uh, mammary cancer contains which receptors, estrogen or progesterone receptors expressing, you will learn it in detail in pathology. So this is just a summary of what I said so far in a nicer picture but this is our slide. So this is the non-lactating mammary gland. Here you can see a lot of connective tissue and a lot of fat. So actually between the branches uh, of the duct system, we have a lot of fat and this connective tissue septa. And then you can see ducts, these are the ducts, and you can see groups of acini, always in those groups as I showed in the beginning in the drawing. Here you can see further examples, always these groups, small groups of acini, but you can see no secretory activity. Here you can see the lumen is small, the cells do not show any signs of secretion. And then during lactation, of course, there is a big change because that's when the, the gland is really active. And uh, we have milk production with apocrine and merocrine secretion. Uh, apocrine is more for the lipid uh, uh, structures and merocrine is more for the proteins, for example. So actually the milk contains everything that the baby needs, so all kinds of nourishments. So that's why we have a mixture of secretory mechanism. And this is our lactating mam mammary gland slide. So this is the whole slide. And if you go to higher magnification, you can see all these holes, which is actually the really huge enlarged uh, big lumen glands. These are the acini here. And you can see the cells inside, which um, uh, is like uh, contains the lipid droplets. And uh, that's why you can see with this uh, magnification, a very pale cytoplasm with a lot of lipid droplets. And some, <clears throat> some uh, ducts you can find 
but you can see the huge difference. Uh, you have hardly any or very few parts where you have the uh, uh, connective tissue and all these really, really enlarged secretory portions. About milk composition, you don't have to know a lot of things, just a few things like it contains everything, okay? Uh, besides, of course, uh, most of it water, we have uh, carbohydrates, fat, proteins, ions, everything that the baby needs. And there are big differences between species. And another word that you should know is colostrum. Colostrum is the four milk, which is only a, a, a small amount of milk. So it's not enough for the baby, for the fluid, uh, it's not enough. But it's very important that the baby gets it because it has a very high level of immunoglobulins. The milk also later contains a lot of immunoglobulins. Uh, sorry, I wanted to uh, stay here. A lot of immunoglobulins, but especially very high content is uh, during the first few days when uh, lactation begins, very high level of immunoglobulin A. This is what baby powder can never replace that the mother produces antibodies against the in the uh, the uh, antigens against bacteria etc in her own environment where the baby is also growing so uh, this specific protection can only be given by uh, milk and uh, this is again just for completion but we don't have uh, this as a slide so i'm just uh, jumping further and just a few words about breast cancer of course you don't have to know details just to mention that uh, it's very important because of cancer and uh, unfortunately one of the most common cancer types in women but it can happen in men as well so this mainly grows from the um, from the ducts here you can see but also from, uh, uh, from the ends, uh, we can have different types. This, of course, you will learn in pathology. And uh, the screening is very important, uh, mammography and self-examination to avoid these uh, very advanced uh, stages. This is just an interesting thing. You don't have to know, of course, that sometimes there are genetic mutations in the background when uh, like in, when this, uh, mutations happen, then we have 80% chance to get breast cancer. And the last thing, the last slide I wanted to show you is, uh, again, embryology, is the development of the so-called milk line. So this is, this is clinically, again, something very important to remember that we have a milk line during embryonic life, and this is similar to the animals, which have a lot of breasts and can, uh, can supply a lot of babies at the same time. We normally, of course, grow only two breasts, but as everything in embryology, and this semester especially, you learn a lot of uh, organ developments where something is supposed to disappear, but it does not disappear. So for example, this is the case here too, that the milk line should disappear completely, except for the two breasts, but, Many times, some remnants are found, especially the closest. So the one underneath the real nipples and the one above or in the uh, um, axillary fossa. So these, these are actually quite common. Most of the times, they ju just look like um, a little uh, dot, a little pigmented area here. But it, it's exactly in this line. And why is this important? Because it can be uh, associated with other malformations, one. So the pediatricians always check this. And second, later, even malformation, even uh, breast cancer can develop from these uh, extra tissues or other complaints like cysts or any other complaints can happen. So you should at least know about it. Okay, so this was uh, the placenta and the breast, and I hope you understood everything. Thank you very much for your attention.